Hey, thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. We have prayed that you'd be blessed by it. Uh, we want you to know, too, we believe that this is really supplemental uh, to your, your experience in the life of a local church. But if you're here in the Dallas area, we hope you'll come and join us and be with us for worship. We pray this blesses your life and you're drawn closer to Christ as a result of this message. Have you ever had a dream uh, that became a nightmare? I guess if you thought about it long enough, you might. I don't often remember my dreams, which I guess makes me wonder, do I dream often? I think we all dream. But a few nights ago, I had a dream that turned into a nightmare. I was with my daughter Whitney, and then out of nowhere, all of a sudden, snakes showed up. I mean, large snakes. The big kind of giant Disney kind of snakes. And she didn't seem to be worried about that. And I, I, I was trying to wonder, what should we do? What should we do? Now, many of you know Whitney's getting married in a couple of weeks, so I don't know. Some of you could help interpret that one for me. I don't know, I don't know what's going on there. But, you know, I suppose we've all had dreams, even in our, in our lives. If you live long enough, you've had dreams that have turned into nightmares. That very thing you thought and hoped would bring great joy, or that moment when you thought, this is life. And then suddenly, it turns into a nightmare. Today, I want to look at a particular version of the American dream, what I think it has become. And I want you to see that the American dream, as we know it, always ends in a nightmare. Now, speaking of nightmares, for I guess half the country at least... Um, in just a couple of weeks, we're going to collectively elect our next president. And many are dreaming and hoping that their candidate will be chosen, and it seems about half of us in our nation are going to see that dream turn into a nightmare. Maybe you're experiencing what some have called, in fact, psychologists call it election stress disorder. It's a real thing. And a lot of people are experiencing it, and psychologists tell us and are reporting that this year there's a higher uh, percentage of those who are experiencing this election stress disorder. I think the collective thought among most of us, people I talk to, is let's get on with this. Let's be done with this. And let's move ahead. We've had enough. But psychologists are reporting that there's more, a higher degree um, this year of election stress disorder because of three things. They've noted the higher degree of conflict surrounding each of the candidates. And then secondly, uh, a lack of confidence in each of the candidates where some would say that, that, that either one is a bad choice or dangerous for our country depending on where you fall. And then the third is a concern of how the turmoil in this particular election is being interpreted or passed on to the next generation, to young people, and even to children who are watching, and then how they might respond in their future engagement in politics or lack thereof. Many young people I talk to are just kind of fed up with it all and don't know what to do. But... For those of us who are followers of Christ, I want to pause for a moment again and just encourage you. We have a different approach to stress and conflict and political engagement. We've been talking about that this month. And we also have an opportunity in these days to be salt and light, to show what it is to place our hopes in something higher than any uh, presidential candidate or leader here on earth on november the 9th we'll have a new president presumably and we will press on with our lives and i just want to remind each of us that our hope is found not in a candidate or even in a particular uh, party our hope is found in christ and in him alone our future is secure. Your core purpose as a Christ follower, the mission of our church to make disciples, will not be moved at all as we press on in the, day, the days ahead. I hope that you're praying with us. We're walking through 40 days of prayer. Collectively, unified as a church, praying the same thing every day 
and you'll hear more, but the, the day before the election, we're going to come together and pray throughout the day. We'll be in Ellis Chapel all day long praying that the Lord will have His way. With so much division in our country, I wonder if we're missing a vital truth that God really is sovereign. He's not watching all this from the sidelines, all that we're witnessing in this election campaign. Uh, it, was, it was Joseph de Matisse who was the great French philosopher, diplomat. He's the one who said that every democracy gets the leader they deserve. That might be the most convicting word that I've heard in recent days. And as a pastor, as, as a believer, I'm seeing that God is exposing our sin. I believe He's calling us to wake up. I believe that He's calling His church to awaken And to recognize again the need for His leadership in our lives. His leadership in our country. And it's going to be those who follow Him that are going to rise up to be the influencers, those who can bring about real change. And it's gospel change. It happens as Christ changes the hearts of people in our nation. No democracy is any better than the people who make it up. What we need are more people who are satisfied completely in Christ and who live their lives in such a way that they glorify Him. If you're discouraged, and some are, perhaps you'll be very discouraged some way after the election, I want to remind you again that until Jesus is running, we will be choosing from lesser candidates. Of course, Jesus is not running because he's already in charge he has already won the victory and as Christ followers we need to remember this and throughout this month we've been seeking to think biblically not from a Democrats perspective or Republican or Independence perspective but from a biblical perspective we've talked about what we've called the politics of Jesus the Greek word politikos essentially refers to how people live together in community. It comes from a word polis, which is the word for city. It's how people live together in a city or community. Of course, in America, we have uh, local, state, and national politics. But for our purposes, we're going to talk about how, and it is politics, how we live together, and then what is the role of government. We've we've wrestled with that a bit. Today, we're going to talk about how is it that we approach wealth, prosperity, and the American dream. Now immediately, and what the scriptures that's already been read today, I think all of us should have a sense of conviction. A lot of these sermons have, over the recent days, uh, have not been easy to preach, and not easy to hear. And so we have another prophetic word that's coming from Paul uh, to his son in ministry. In fact, you can go ahead and turn there to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. You can turn there as we think about wealth, prosperity, and the American dream. One of the key issues in the election this year has been for years, I think, is, is um, what about the middle class? We all think or know that, that uh, gosh, the more uh, people flourish across the culture, the better all of us are. And so which party or candidate will bring about this, this, uh, this this uh, wealth or, or economic advantage primarily for the, for the middle class. Because many are saying that over the past 30, 40 years there's been such a disparity or, or, or that the middle class is not any better than it's been over that period of time. And, and there's this great disparity of wealth and it's widening. It's not getting tighter, not getting closer. But I want us to see here uh, this morning what God's Word says about those who have much. Now, I know when we talk about wealth, wealth is relative. In fact, CNN did a study uh, or reported 2015, a year ago, that only 4% of millionaires think that they're rich. Because we, we compare, I think it was Teddy Roosevelt who said, comparison is the, is the enemy of joy. And we all do that in varying degrees. Uh, we, we think that relative uh, uh, that wealth is, is relative, but I want to just remind us today, and certainly in view of the first hearers, the, the first readers of this letter to Timothy would have, would have thought this. But I want to remind you uh, that if you're here, which is self-evident, 
uh, you're rich. What might not be so self-evident uh, is that you're, you're wealthy and rich beyond most people's comprehension. We live not only in the wealthiest country, one of the wealthiest now, in the world. We live as the wealthiest people who've ever lived in the history of mankind. When we consider the poorest countries on the planet, you go to Africa is where you'll find them, Zimbabwe, Burundi, the Congo, where people have an average income of $300 a year, $25 a month. Now, if you go out with a friend today and pay for their lunch, go out with a spouse, you're probably going to spend that at lunch today. An entire monthly income for others in the world. Now, I know we hear this often as those who are privileged and affluent, and we wonder, well, what do I do with that? Well, God's Word tells us what to do with that. And we're going to see that here today. 1 Timothy chapter 6. We see the American dream can end in a nightmare, depending on how we might define it. I want us to talk about waking up from the American dream. I believe God is calling each of us to wake up. The first thing I want you to see is this. The politics of Jesus always lead to godliness. Look at verse, uh, let's begin with the latter part of verse 2. Now, let me place this in context. Paul has been teaching Timothy and others. He says, hey, if you're an indentured servant, this is interesting, if you're under someone, you need to respect them. You need to submit. You need to follow well. He says, because then God will be honored. And especially if it's another believer because they are beloved. You're a brother or a sister. He's given instruction on how to follow this is important. Someone's noted that in America we don't uh, serve our leaders well. We don't honor our leaders because we don't know how to be led. We don't want to follow anyone. And what Paul is saying here is here's what it means to be a good follower. Well, then he says, teach and urge these things. Now, he's getting to the end of his letter, so he really means all things, as we'll see, all that he's been teaching. If anyone, verse 3 if anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ, with the sound words and the teaching that accords with godliness, that is to say that, that aligns with, that lines up with godliness, he is puffed up, he's prideful with conceit and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words which produce envy, dissension, slander. We've not seen any of this in these days. Evil suspicions. Constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth. Depraved in mind and deprived of truth. Imagining that godliness is a means of gain. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we take nothing out of the world. And as, as Jack read earlier, look at verse 8. For if we have food and clothing with these, we will be content. I wonder how many of us can really say that today. I got a hunch, maybe, maybe none of us, including your pastor. I've got food, I've got something to put on my body. I'm good. That's all I need. That's what he's saying here. Verse 9, but those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, and it is through this craving, that desire, that some have wandered away from the faith. Even believers have decided no longer, or those who are in the church are just left, I can't can't do this, and pierce themselves. Notice it's self-inflicted with many pangs. That word is all-consuming pain, devastating sorrow. Some of us here today have experienced or seen that kind of pain and devastating sorrow. As we consider waking up from the American dream, it was James Truslow, 
uh, who James, James Trussell Adams, who coined the phrase the American dream. He defined it this way. He said, the, the American dream, it's a dream in which every man and each woman shall be able to attain the fullest stature of which they are innately capable and to, rec- and to be recognized by others for who they are. We know that Jesus offers another way. Jesus offers a way of life that's not a dream, but a reality in Him. John Locke is the one who, in his original treatise, he said that the role of government was to protect a man's right to life, liberty, and property. Thomas Jefferson is the one who took his brilliant mind and imagination and said let's broaden this not just property not this desire to acquire only but to happiness whatever that might be now clearly the desire to have things property material possessions has stuck and that's how we have now primarily defined the american dream in the declaration of independence it says the pursuit of happiness the pursuit of more however seems to have have struck now now, the, the paradox, it's called the pleasure paradox, the paradox of hedonism says that you will never find pleasure by pursuing it. And I think what's happened is the way we've redefined happiness, we've now caught ourselves in a never-ending search for more, better, something else. We no longer replace things, we upgrade things. We continue to get more and more. Cadillac used to run a series of ads Um, And the tagline was life, uh, liberty, and the pursuit. Pursuit of what? I guess a pursuit of, of a Cadillac. Pursuit of more. Pursuit of something better. Pursuit of finally happiness. Will I finally get it with the next thing? They asked J.D. Rockefeller, how much is enough? And he returned a simple question, one more dollar? I don't know. A little bit more. That's always the case. It's the paradox of hedonism, which is a philosophical term, by the way. It's not a theological or biblical term, and yet deeply theological as we look at this. The first thing I want you to see here, again, the politics of Jesus always lead to godliness. Look at verse 3. See, instead of pursuing more and more things and money, we pursue Him. We pursue Christ and all that he teaches us, true doctrine and biblical teaching will be a recognizable part of your life. It always impacts daily living, and you'll see it. This is what Paul is saying. Instead of pursuing more, we pursue Jesus, and in him we find we have enough. We find that in him we are satisfied. The next thing I want you to see here is the politics of the world always lead to greediness. The politics, the way of life together under God in Christ leads to godliness. But the politics of the world, the way of the world always leads to greediness. I've said it before as a pastor, I've never had anyone come into my office and I've, I've heard a lot of confessed sin before me, but I've never heard anyone say, I confess I'm the greediest person that I know. Because greed is unseen by its hosts it's undetected but Paul tells us God's word tells us how we can see how how can we know if we're greedy we'll see that in a moment look at what it says in verse 5 4 and 5 depraved mind deprived of truth imagining that godliness is a means of of gain now now if you first read that then you think godliness is a mean to get a means toward gain many of us would say well sure it is But that betrays our understanding. Many of us have this idea, if I follow God, surely He'll bless me. And in the moment that He doesn't bless you, in the way you define blessing, you don't know what to do. Because you saw God as a kind of one-arm bandit, as if we would just pull the lever and He would bless us in the way that we want Him to. And most often, it is in some material way or through comfort, security. Friends, listen, if we pursue God for something that He will give us instead of pursuing Him simply because He's God, that's not worship, that's idolatry. 
If we seek Him for what He can do for us. This is what Jesus was getting at in John chapter 6. There's a story there where He feeds the 5,000 and then He goes away from the crowd and the disciples come and find Him and say, when did you get here? They finally find Him and He says, you're not seeking Me simply to find Me. You're pursuing Me because you had your stomachs filled. You're not pursuing Me because of the signs that you've seen that point to me as Messiah. And friends, we, we tend to do the same. Most of us here would say, well, I don't believe in a health and wealth gospel, but I think that all of us have fallen into the trap where we believe that if we follow God and do these things, then He should bless us. That's a law of reciprocity. That's not grace that comes to us, whether we do good or not do good if we're in Christ. And for many people in Dallas, frankly, I've seen this through the years, going to church has become part of the American dream. I mean, we want to make sure we got everything covered, and if I go to church, then I'll, I'll be blessed. If I'm moral, then good things will come my way. Now, there's benefit to living a godly life. But I think sometimes people can enter into church. It happens. They go to church to gain some kind of social position. I've known people through the years who would go to church believe it or not, for, for some advantage in their business. It's a great place to find clients or more customers. Some have a skewed approach and they come to godliness thinking there's some gain, some worldly gain in pursuing God somehow for even a pursuit of spiritual things can become for us. So we seek to worship God simply because He's God. David Platt, who is now the um, president of the International Mission Board, the IMB, wrote a book called Radical some years ago. Maybe you read this book. In it, he says this, We are settling for a Christianity that revolves around catering to ourselves when the central message of Christianity is a, actually about abandoning ourselves. We now have a nice middle-class American Jesus. A Jesus who doesn't mind materialism and would never call us to give away everything we have. A Jesus who is fine with nominal devotion that does not infringe on our comforts. And I think what we're seeing in our day, in our current time, the more persecution that comes to believers in our nation, and I know that falls on deaf ears when we think of our brothers and sisters in Syria, places like Iraq, but more and more persecution, ostr ostracizing of believers, marginalization of believers. The more that comes, that will change us. That will separate those who are nominal cultural Christians and those who are fully devoted followers of Christ. It's happening. So I want to ask you, how are you doing? How is the Spirit speaking into your heart? Proverbs twenty two sixteen says, Whoever oppresses the poor to increase his own wealth or gives to the rich will only come to poverty. You say, I'm not, I'm not keeping from the poor. Well, if, if you're not giving, then you are in some way, some form. Constant pleasure seeking will never satisfy. The American dream void of Christ ends in a nightmare. But the reality, not a dream, but the reality of trusting Christ, following Him daily, ends in praise, purpose, and ultimately in paradise. So the Lord tells us in 1 Timothy 6, this is uh, what we're going to look at in the days to come. As for the rich, here's what you do. In this present age, charge them not to be haughty or prideful, saw this earlier, not, nor, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God. Are you doing that in these days? Who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They're to do good. Look at this, to be rich, not to desire rich, to be rich, or to hope to be rich, but to actually be rich. To be rich in good deeds, to be generous and ready to share. Thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the for the future so that they may be or may take hold of that which is truly life friends my great hope for you is that you'll be rich and it's going to come as you give your heart and your life to Christ 
the one who said it's more blessed to give than receive. Jesus himself, who gave to us more than we could ever repay, more than we could ever give back to him. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. For you know of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. Praise be to God. He's rescued us from the American dream. It always ends in a nightmare so that we can experience the praise of our Savior as we give our lives to Him all for His glory. To worship Him with all that we are. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes and come before Him. Friend, if you've heard anything today, you've heard that until Christ becomes enough, you will always be thirsty for more. Have you decided to follow Jesus? Have you decided to give Him your life? And so often, for so many, the last thing we're willing to give are our possessions, our money. I want to encourage you to be a giver. Be a giver. You will be set free. Lord, thank you that you became rich on our behalf or you became poor in your wealth on our behalf so that we might become rich in you, in all that matters. And so, Lord, we give you our lives anew. We decide to follow you with all that we have. The most important decision we'll make in the next few weeks and throughout our lives is whether we will decide to serve you with all we have and all that we are. Friend, if you've never received Christ, you can do so now by faith. Receive His grace. He died on the cross for your sin so that you might be forgiven and live forgiven, set free from the stuff of this world. So Lord, we give you our lives. We hold on loosely to all that we are, all that we have. We give you our lives anew. Take our lives. Use them to your glory, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. And amen. Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.